We're continuing, as you probably have gathered from the uh, bulletin information, our series on David. Yes, there will be an end. There's a time for all things. I already have some ideas for another series. Uh, Next week, God willing, we'll have David part 12, and uh, the king will rest with his fathers from that point on. But we pick up our story now, and this is a very interesting and in some respects a troubling study today in the life of David. We left off after the rebellion of Absalom. Absalom was slain. Now keep in mind, God, or rather the Lord, had uh, made it clear that Absalom was a rebel and that he was proud and that he was a problem. David, nonetheless, had instructed his generals to be gentle with Absalom. And Joab, the main general, executed him. Now don't lose that because it comes into play here in this story. David, um, he climbs up the stairs to the watchtower and he weeps in those beautiful moving words of scripture. Oh Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, my son, would God I had died for thee. Oh Absalom, my son. And in that little silhouette you have a picture of the gospel well David Absalom slain and David is reinstated in the kingdom of Judea but Israel now is not so sure they want David to be their king he appeared to be vulnerable and so some of the die hard loyal people the king saw from the tribe of Benjamin thought this could be our chance to make our move and overthrow David Now, you've got to know that there was a little bit of tribal rivalry between Judea and the tribes of Israel. Judea was the vastly bigger tribe. They actually occupied all of the southern part of the territory of Israel. They had a bigger inheritance than any of the other tribes. And some of the other tribes felt like they were just gobbling everything up. And so David, from the tribe of Judah... It made sense he should be their king. But why was he king over Israel and the other 11 tribes? So during this time, a gentleman by the name of Sheba thought he'd make his move and he'd establish himself as a king of the northern tribes. And that's where we pick up our story. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the second book of Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. We'll be looking at two chapters today, chapter 20 and chapter 21. And there happened to be a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite, and he blew the trumpet and said, We have no part in David, nor do we have an inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. He's addressing the other eleven tribes. So every man of Israel deserted David, and they followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah from Jordan, as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king, King David. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house. You remember what happened to them when they were left behind? Absalom sealed his abhorrence for his father by sleeping with his father's harem. Now David said, "Uh, things are never going to be the same in my relationship with these ladies anymore. And so they were then separated from him. They were no longer part of his harem. And um, they lived by themselves in widowhood until the day of their death. Verse 4. Then the king said to Amasa, wait a second, who's Amasa? Now I want you to notice something. Don't lose your spot here in 2 Samuel 20. But in 2 Samuel 17, when Absalom rebelled against David, he picked a general who was a shirt-tailed relative of David. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the army instead of Joab. Joab was David's general. Joab was David's nephew from David's sister Zeruiah who had followed David ever since the days he was living in the cave, had been with him for, oh, 35 years at this point, had been his general, a little bit headstrong, did things his own way, was not a perfect man, but he had been a good general. But David is upset. David is is really fed up with... Joab, because David very explicitly said, be gentle with Absalom. Joab, word had reached David that Joab had found Absalom hanging from his hair in a tree. He could have been spared, but Joab knew that the kingdom would never be secure as long as Absalom was alive. And for the good of many, he needed to die. 
Joab knew that David was not thinking with his head, he was thinking with the heart of a father, and justice demanded that in spite of David's order, Absalom had to die, or the kingdom would never be safe. Well, David resented that. So now, he picks another general. Who does he pick? He picks the man who had just a little while earlier been leading forces into battle against himself. Well, that's not good thinking either. But David was a good king, but sometimes he was a little soft. And now David picks Absalom's general to be his general. Well, he didn't do Absalom much good, did he? Remember what happened when Joab met them in in battle? They all turned and ran. We don't know what's going through David's mind. The Bible doesn't tell us at this time. But he's getting a little older. Uh, Maybe he's thinking with his emotions. There may have been a lapse in judgment. And he's got people around him taking care of him. So the Bible says, David says to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for, with, for me within three days and present yourself here. We're going to have to get an army and fight against this fellow who's rebelling against the kingdom. The kingdom of God is being threatened. Now keep in mind, later on, after the reign of Solomon, the kingdom does split. The kingdom had never been split yet. This is a civil war. It's a crisis every bit as severe as the crisis that happened in North America when the North fought against the South. Some of you may not be aware, but do you know that Americans lost more soldiers, even with our sparse population during the Civil War, than we've lost in any other war? Are you aware of that? That was a terribly bloody battle. Our whole nation, our our whole country was in crisis uh, on the verge of being split. Now this is on the verge of happening again. And David, like Lincoln, says we can't let that happen. So he says we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to get rid of this instigator. Amasa gathered the men together. He set a date. He said be here, certain place, certain time. Well, Amasa was a, a relative, but he wasn't a very good general. And the Bible says, uh, So Amasa went to assemble the men, verse 5, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. Now David says to Abishai, that's Joab's brother, who was one of David's generals, one of David's mighty men. Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him. We don't have time for an all-out battle. Find him. Lest he find for himself a fortified city and escape us. And so Joab's, whose men? Now Joab is with his brother Abishai. Joab's men with the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men. This was David's honor guard. They went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now the word Sheba means fullness. He was a Benjamite. A relative of Saul. He was uh, still thinking it wasn't fair that Saul had been overthrown. He was full of himself. That's what the name means, fullness. He thinks, I want to be king. I'm going to make myself king. God had not chosen him. And so now Joab and Abishai are pursuing him. And it says in verse 8, When they were at the large stone which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab is facing the general who had been leading Absalom's forces against King David. Joab is facing the man who is now supposed to be technically his replacement. And I'm not justifying, I'm just telling you what's going on here. You've got the old general and the new general. You've got the one who had always been loyal to David and the one who had just been fighting against David. Amasa had been a hypocrite. One day he's fighting to kill David and next day he's fighting for David. I mean, he wasn't very consistent. And so Joab used stealth. He was sort of a cunning man. And Joab was dressed in his battle armor and on it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. It, he leaned over for some reason, and it fell out of the sheath, and I think he planned that, tying a sandal or something. And Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? They were relatives. Remember what I said? And while he took Amasa by the beard, they used to kiss each other on the cheek, to kiss him, but Amasa did not notice the sword that was in his hand. What that means is he didn't pay very close attention. He said he dropped his sword, he picked it up. He also wasn't very bright, was he? If you know Joab, (laughs) and he's got a sword in his hand, you don't get too close. That's how Abner died. And Joab took him and said, Are you well, my brother? He didn't notice the sword that was in his hand, and he struck him with it in the stomach. 
and this isn't very pretty, so I'm going to skip that next few words there. If you don't have your Bibles, it serves you right. And he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now, why did Joab kill Amasa? Here you've got the kingdom divided between the north and the south. The whole thing we're dealing with in today's message is preserving the kingdom. For the purpose of preserving the kingdom, certain people had to be dealt with. For the good of many, some people had to be dealt with. When you read the story of Solomon, one of the first things Solomon does when he comes into power is he purges people who are not loyal from the court. His kingdom was prosperous and peaceful for 40 years. Not only was the kingdom now divided between the northern tribes of Israel and Judah, the soldiers are now divided between some are following Amasa and some are following Joab. And Joab says, we're never going to win. The kingdom is doomed unless we have unity. And he takes things upon himself and he kills this hypocrite, vacillating general who had been serving Absalom just a little earlier. Keep in mind also, Amasa had been leading Israel into battle and now they're going to fight Israel. Maybe he'll change his mind in the heat of battle. So Joab, you heard me say in my last message on David, he sort of represents judgment. He's not thinking with his heart. He's not thinking with his emotions. Joab was a coldly calculating, logical man. And so he kills Amasa. And there Amasa's on the road and they're chasing Sheba. And it says here that... um, Amasa wasn't completely dead yet. He's wallowing in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the men are following Joab, they stop to watch this. You've seen that happen when a car breaks down, right? Just congests the whole traffic. And they're so involved in this recent scandal that's going to be in the papers the next day that nobody's thinking about the battle. And finally it says, And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him. That's where the police got that idea. And when he saw that everyone who came upon him halted, so he removed from the highway all the people, and once he was removed from the highway, all the people went after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now there's a little illustration for us there. Sometimes when we're fighting in God's battles, we can become so distracted with what's right in front of us on the highway that we forget what the objective is. They needed to get him out of the way where they could go on and fight what the real battle was, where the enemy was, which was Sheba, who was now dividing the kingdom. Everybody was being distracted and disheartened. And he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth Maacah and all the Berites. So they were gathered together and also they went after Sheba. Then they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maacah, and they cast up a siege mound against the city and stood by it with the rampart. All right, they surrounded the city where this rebel is living, and they're not going to give up until they get him. And they're getting ready to destroy the city. And all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman cried out from the city. Up on the wall, this old lady appears. Here you got Joab and all of Judah and they've surrounded the city and they've got ramparts and they're battering down the wall. An old lady gets up on the wall and she's got one of these old bull horns, you know, the kind without the electric amplifier. And she shouts out after Joab. She says, are you Joab? And he says, I am. And everyone stops beating on the wall. She said, hear the words of your maidservant. He said, I'm listening. Then she spoke saying, They used to talk in former times saying they will surely ask counsel at Abel. Now the people of Issachar were considered the wisest counselors in Israel. This is one of the tribes that was known for its wisdom and its prudence. The people were very bright and and intelligent. She said, here you're beating down a city that's renowned for its judgment. And so they would end disputes. I am among the peaceable and the faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? You're fighting against your own people. And Joab answers and says, Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That's not so, but there's a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri, by name. He's raised up his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only, and I'll depart from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Now, we don't know exactly what she said. This lady was prudent. 
And this is one of the stories in the Bible where you've got a woman winning a battle without arms, but with logic. She goes back down to the elders of the city and she said, let's have a board meeting. Uh, Sheba, can you wait outside the door for just a minute? And she recounts to them how many times others have raised up against David and fallen. Saul fought him, slipped through his fingers every time. The Philistines couldn't hurt him. The Moabites, the Edomites, the Amorites, the Syrians, they all fell before David. His own son rose up against him. Absalom's dead under a pile of rocks off in the woods of Ephraim. David's back on the throne. And she said, now you want to follow Sheba? David just keeps bouncing back. He's chosen by God. You want to follow Sheba? You're going to be destroyed for nothing. They looked at each other and they took a vote. Pretty soon Sheba's head went flying over the wall of the city. And the whole city was spared. It was obvious that that rebel had to be dealt with if the city was going to be spared. Now, you know, as I read this story, and I know that these stories are all here to, to deliver spiritual lessons for you and me, I can think of several other stories in the Bible where one rebel endangered many when he was embraced or when he was tolerated. You remember the story, of course, of uh, Jonah. You got Jonah running from God. God says, Jonah, I want you to go east. He says, no. And he goes west. And he's off in a ship. And everybody in the ship is in danger of drowning because they are harboring a rebel. When did they finally have peace? When Jonah went swimming. They had to throw Jonah over the wall just like Sheba's head, so to speak. Then they had calm. You've got the story of Achan. You remember that story? God specifically gave commands that they were not to steal any of the plunder from Jericho. It was all to be committed to the Lord and to the temple. Achan didn't think that was really an important law. So he stole some of the gold and the silver and the clothing and hid it in his tent. Then when the children of Israel went off into battle, they were losing before their enemies because there was sin in the camp. And Joshua said, what's the problem? And the Lord said, you're harboring a rebel. You need to deal with that cancer or it's going to spread. And so they piled up stones on top of Achan. Got real quiet. That means you're either thinking or all sleeping. Some churches experience undue turmoil. Loss of power. They fail to have victories against the enemy. They're easily overcome. And it's because they're not dealing with sin and rebels in the camp. Now this is not a popular subject, but I'm confident it's a Bible subject. Paul addressed a similar situation in the New Testament. He wrote a very cutting letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians. There was a man in the church that the church was just sort of looking the other way. He was having a torrid, adulterous affair with his stepmother. And everybody's kind of going, well, boy, isn't that something? But the church wasn't dealing with it. And Paul said, you need to deal with this or you're going to suffer for it. Indeed, he seems to suggest when he talks about the communion service, there were some who were already sick because they weren't dealing with things. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4 through 7. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of this individual sleeping with his stepmother, Deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to pause right here because that's been an often misunderstood scripture. Some people think that you can give someone to the devil and he'll be saved. It's not what he's saying. What he's saying is he's living for the flesh right now, but those who live for the flesh end up very unhappy. They suffer as a result and hopefully he'll come to his senses and repent and he can be saved. So in other words, by putting him out of the church and handing him over and saying, look, you're cast out. If you want to live for God, what's the other choice? You live for the devil. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. And if you're not with him, who are you with? The devil. So when Paul is saying, deliver such one unto the devil, he's saying, put him out of the church, that he'll come to his senses as he tries to live for the flesh, he'll realize how miserable he is, and perhaps he'll be saved. That's all that Paul is saying. I've actually heard preachers say, well, he was saved, and he's, he's going to live for the devil, but he's still saved. That's not what it's talking about. 
Now, I want to go on here and notice what Paul says in the rest of this passage here. He says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven, a little Sheba, a little Achan, a little Jonah, leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you might be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. Churches are affected by political policy. Because we live in a government, it's really impossible for us to say that we're not affected by the policies of the government. One of the policies in America that is very dangerous is we are so concerned with the rights of the criminals that we forget about the rights of the victims. We're so preoccupied with being humane and loving and considerate that we're becoming so tolerant of crime that it's completely taking over. There are times to practice tough love. And you notice, even in this passage, what is Paul suggesting is the reason for putting this person out of the church? That he might come to his senses and be saved. See, God does these difficult things for the ultimate good, not only of the greater part, but for the individual. You know, a lot of Americans had a fit when supposedly an American young man was spraying graffiti on the walls in Singapore. Or on cars in Singapore. Remember that? Has it been so long ago you've forgotten? And they said they're going to spank him. And we were outraged that he was going to be spanked. They didn't kill him. It hurt. Protesting. Sending ambassadors. Having a fit. And I kept thinking, why? So their streets can look like ours? We're going to give them advice on law? We're going to tell Singapore how to govern? And have you ever been to Singapore? I haven't been there, but I've heard it's a very, is that right? It's a clean city. they got strict laws, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather walk up and down those streets where everything's clean and you're safe and they have a very low crime rate and not be telling them how to run their country. Now, having said that, one of the hardest things you've got to deal with as a pastor is from time to time because it becomes evident there's a person who is rebelling against the Lord. I'm not talking about when members make mistakes that, that are part of Christian growth and sanctification If we put people out of the church every time that happened, the building would be empty right now. I'm talking about people who are rebelling. They're turning their back on God. They're not living out their baptismal vows. They should not be on the books. When you leave people on the books, you lower the standards of Christ. You grieve the Holy Spirit. You limit the blessings that God can bring into a church. And you know, I just think it's the highest form of mockery when I visit churches from time to time and I'll ask the pastor before the service, how many go to your church? Now, I'm very careful. I say, how many go? And the pastor will say, we've got a thousand on the books. I said, how many go? Well, 150. So, are the others all sick? It's a mockery to God because when your name is on the church books, and incidentally, keep in mind, everybody, the doors are open, everybody is welcome to come and to worship the Lord in the house of God. But when your name is on the rolls of a church, that means you are authorized to hold office and it's assumed that your life is in harmony with the teachings of Christ and your vows of of marriage to the Lord. It ought to stand for something. And if church membership doesn't stand for something, you fall for anything. And you've got to deal with those rebels or everybody suffers. And it's not pleasant. No more pleasant than watching a head without a body fly over a wall. It is not pleasant. And it must be done with prayer and it must be done in a Christian spirit. But the time comes when for the good of many you sometimes have to deal with hypocrites. You know, Paul addresses this again. He said to Timothy, Those who are sinning openly rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may fear. You know, we're very quiet about saying anything because everybody has these little favorite things we like to quote. You're not supposed to judge. Have you heard that one? You know, the Bible tells you you are supposed to judge. How come people don't quote that one? Jesus says, when you judge, judge a righteous judgment. You are supposed to judge. We're supposed to use wisdom. Christ said that we're supposed to judge them by their fruits. We are supposed to use our brains and think. Or someone will say, well, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Oh, no, that's, that, that's not what Christ was talking about. He's talking about people getting ready to execute a woman. You don't apply that when it comes to taking a person's name off the rolls because they're not living a consistent life. What's the ultimate extreme of never dealing with people who say they're Christians but are living like the devil? It, you, 
So the church with, with the people on the rolls who are hypocrites and the world looks at us and say, they all say that they're Christians, but look at their lives. Shouldn't it stand for something? Okay, I feel better. I got that off my chest. Now we go to another difficult passage. Turn back with me to 2 Samuel chapter 20. And so, the Bible says they threw the head over the wall and Joab blew the trumpet and withdrew from the city. They had peace when they took care of that rebel who was rebelling against David, who was God's anointed. And it's just not a safe thing to do. Let's jump down to chapter 21. Now we've got another passage. Difficult story. There was a famine in the days of David. Now after this experience, he's reestablished on the throne, but for three years... And there's no rain. Year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And he says, is there some spiritual reason for this? And the Lord answered, it's because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house because he killed the Gibeonites. Now, you've got to know your Bibles. Why would God be punishing? We've got a couple of questions to ask here. First of all, who are the Gibeonites? And what, what did Saul do to them that was wrong? If you know your Bible story, you remember the book of Joshua, chapter 9, verse 15. The Gibeonites were a people who lived in Canaan when the Israelites took possession of Canaan. They knew God was with the Israelites. They knew the Israelites had been instructed to annihilate the seven nations that had control. They wanted to live. So they were very clever. They sent ambassadors that pretended they were from a far country. They put on these old moldy clothes and they got some moldy bread. They had torn up shoes. They said, we've come from a far country. We heard the Lord's with you. Make a covenant with us. And without inquiring of the Lord, Joshua and the elders made a covenant with the Gibeonites that they wouldn't fight with them or have war with them. Then they found out they had ended up making a covenant with people that lived down the street. And they said, what do we do? And you can find this here in the, in the book of Joshua, chapter 9, verse 15. Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. And from the time of Joshua up to the time of Saul, every ruler had honored that vow to God not to harm the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites did not harm the Israelites. They kind of coexisted. Well, Saul lived in Gibeah. The word Gibeah means hill. Saul did not like coexisting with people that were not from his tribe, and so he, in his zeal, sought to annihilate the Gibeonites. He broke the vow that God's people had made to that nation. It doesn't matter that what they did was wrong and the way they tricked them, they had made a vow. And now the people are suffering a famine, and Saul is dead and gone. Wait a second, Doug. Why would God do this to Israel after Saul's already dead? Let me share a principle with you that you may or may not know. The Bible says that uh, the anger and punishment of God, because God is so merciful, uh, gets stored up. Not to be released upon Christians, but ultimately the wrath of God is going to be released. Sometimes a little spurt comes out, like in the days of Noah. His wrath was stored up 120 years. They preached and he released his wrath. When the waters came down, the waters came up, the rocks were rent, and the wicked were destroyed. He bore with them patiently. God's patient. But there are times when he releases his wrath. Do you remember when Jesus wept over Jerusalem? You know what he said in his prayer? Matthew chapter 23 verse 35. He's talking about Jerusalem that stones the prophets and rejects the truth. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Wait a second. Why would, why would the Lord punish the generation in which Christ lived for things that happened hundreds of years earlier with Zechariah and thousands of years earlier with Abel? God's wrath stores up. He's very patient. And if you're not under his grace and under his wings, when the dam breaks, it's a bad place to be. If you read about the seven last plagues, you know what they're called? The wrath of God. The whole, the whole ball of wax is going to melt down on this world in that one phase just before Christ comes. And let me give you another one. Romans chapter 2 verse 5. Talking about the wrath of God. Romans 2 verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath. Now what did Paul say there? Wrath can be what? 
Treasured up. You know what that means? Stored away. You're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgments of God. There's going to be a day when God reveals His righteous judgments. He's very patient. He doesn't do it every day all the time. And Solomon, I believe, says in Ecclesiastes there, because sentence against an evil work does not come speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Because God does not bonk us on the head as soon as we think a bad thought or commit a bad deed, we become hardened in our bad behavior. God is very patient. Generations might go by without seeing the wrath of God. But it comes. He said, you're treasuring up for yourself back in Romans the wrath coming in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. Now that's something good. If your sins are covered under the blood of Jesus, you don't need to worry. Eternal life eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, very clear, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. There will be two groups when the wrath falls. Those who are covered by His wings and those who will be under the wrath. Now, the point is, you and I, if we live during the seven last plagues, we're going to experience wrath from former generations that's been pent up. I'll tell you, we're really storing it away in the account right now, friends. Talking about as a nation and as a people, as a world, it's going to really, it's going to fall heavy and hard. Well, Saul had broken the vow of the Lord and now they're suffering from something that had been done earlier. God knew the right timing. So the king called the Gibeonites, verse 2, and he spoke to, spoke to them. Now there's some of the survivors were left and they're still being persecuted maybe by Saul's family. And the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, now I'm in 2 Samuel 21, verse 3, What shall I do for you, and with what shall I make atonement, that you might bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, We'll have neither silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. He said, Ask what you will, and I'll do it for you. And they answered the king, As for this man, Saul, who consumed us and plotted against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. Now, this is a very hard thing for David. You'll understand why as I read on. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath. You notice the difference between Saul and David? David made a promise he's going to keep it. He made a vow to Jonathan that he would spare his seed, and he spares Mephibosheth. Remember we studied that? He ate at the king's table. And he spared Mephibosheth because of his oath. So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth now this is the uncle of Mephibosheth they have the same name the two sons of Rizpah the daughter of Ai Ai is how you say that Uh, now who's Rizpah any of you remember that when Saul died that Abner took a man named Ishbosheth to be king in place of his father Saul Saul had a concubine named Rizpah who was not his regular wife and Ishbosheth said to Abner, his general, you're having an affair with my father's widow. Abner got so outraged, he marched right to David and said, I'm giving the kingdom to you. That was the woman in that controversy, Rizbah. Okay? She had a couple of children with Saul. And so he took her two sons, the daughter of uh, Aya, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholophite. Now, wait a second. Isn't Michael David's, daughter, David's wife, Saul's daughter? Evidently, Saul had another daughter named Merab. David was going to marry her, but Saul became impatient. He gave her to Adriel, Merab. Merab had several children, and the Bible doesn't tell us how, but she died. Michael, this is very important, so catch this. Michael, who is David's wife, ends up raising some of her nephews and nieces, Merab's children. For her brother-in-law, Adriel. Whose house do you think they grew up in? Who's Michael married to? David. She's raising some of Saul's grandchildren. 
David is caring for his enemies, grandchildren in his own house. Now, the Gibeonites are saying, we want seven sons of Saul. David's watched these kids grow up. They're now grown men. They were living in Gibeah. And I expect that, and this is very important, you're going to read this story on the surface and some of you are going to think that God is endorsing human sacrifice for sin. That's not what's happening here. Evidently, from the context, the descendants of Saul were still committing crimes against the Gibeonites. They're not being offered as sacrifice so much as they're, they're uh, paying for their own sins. They're being taken out of the way. They had been a threat to the Gibeonites. They were breaking the vow of God to the people. And that's why they said, we don't want just anyone to die. It's the ones who are persecuting us that we want taken out of the way. So David knew it was true. And he allowed these seven, seven men to be hung. He delivered them into their hands of the Gibeonites. And they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together. And they were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. That was during Passover. Now when did these, how many men? There's an important lesson here. Seven men, when did they die? During the time, when did Christ die? During Passover. And you also notice that it's at the beginning of a harvest. What happened right after Christ's death? Pentecost. Big harvest. Okay, seven. Nice Bible number. Represents completeness. Now, before I go into the spiritual applications here, I want to just bring out one more principle. You remember reading in the Ten Commandments where it says, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. But just before it says that, it says, visiting the iniquity the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. But there's another place in the Bible where God says the son shall not bear the penalty of the father nor the father the penalty of the son. Why does God say that the children will suffer unto the third and fourth generation? Does God take the bad behavior of the parent and punish the children for it? No. What happens is the behavior of the parents is more times than not reproduced in the children. And so the children get the same curse as the parents because the kids have modeled after their parents. The sons of Saul were persecuting the Gibeonites and killing them just like their father had done. Okay. Did that make sense? You all have a far away look in your eyes right now. A lot of details in this study today. And so he delivered them during the harvest. Now notice this, verse 10. This is a very, um, a very sad and a very moving passage. Verse 10, 2 Samuel 21. Now Rizpah, who's this? This is the mother and the um, stepmother of the seven boys. Five of, uh, two of them were hers. Five of them were her stepchildren. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. Now that seems to imply she not only put sackcloth as like burlap, it's potato sack, it was the cheapest form of cloth. She not only put it down, she made a dwelling out of it. Okay, like a tent. From the beginning of harvest until the late rains. You know another word for the late rains? The latter rain. Now what's the latter rain a symbol of? For us it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. From the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. She did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day or the beasts of the field by night. Now you've got the picture of this woman. Her sons have been slain largely for their bad behavior. And she, they're hanging. It's a macabre picture. They're swinging from an oak tree. The Bible says that uh, there was an oak on the hill of Saul of Gibeah and maybe it's that very same tree where Saul used to like to camp out under these trees. And uh, these seven corpses are swinging for days and weeks. And as the birds of carrion try and come by, she takes a stick and chases them away. And at night she keeps a lonely vigil as the beasts come. And uh, this goes on for a long time. Now I want you to have a picture here. What is sackcloth a symbol of in the Bible? Mourning, repentance. Is that safe to say? It's almost consistently always used that way. What is a woman a symbol of. Here you've got a woman and then you've got hung between heaven and earth. Is that a symbol of crucifixion? Yeah, a very vivid symbol. The Bible 
simply never makes a distinction between hung by a rope or hung by a tree. It says those that are hung. Here you've got her, I like the church, she's mourning, she's in a state of repentance, and she's doing it until the rains come. Now what should the church be doing now? Uh, shouldn't we be looking at Jesus who died for our sins and mourning our sins and praying that God will cleanse us and make us fit dwellings for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? And where was she camping? She was camping on a rock. That would be a hard place to pitch a tent. Who would want to sleep there? What's a rock a symbol of? Christ. This is a picture of the church. What did the disciples do before they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? They were in an attitude of repentance. They studied the Word of God, the rock, together. They humbled themselves. They did it for ten days. They thought about the scenes of the crucifixion and the sacrifice of Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit poured out. It's not a happier, a popular subject, but you know, I don't think we're going to see an outpouring of the Spirit until we as Christians humble ourselves before the Lord, ask forgiveness for our sins, confess our faults to one another, lay aside our differences, make room in our hearts for the outpouring of the Spirit, you'll see a mighty revival come. She did it until the rains came. David, verse 11, was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went. Now, who is David? He's a symbol of Christ. He says, enough is enough. He goes and he takes the bones of Saul and Jonathan that had been buried in Gilead that uh, the Philistines had slain. He gets also, verse 13, the bones of these seven men who had been hanged, and he buries them. He puts it away. It's out of sight now. And the Bible says, And the Lord heeded their prayer. This is verse 14. And the rains came, and God poured out His Spirit, and the blessing of God returned. Now, we're closing with another story. Now, I want you to notice there's a a line here. As I looked at these stories, I tell you, friends, it's tough. You know, when I said, I'm going to do the life of David, I said, I'm going to do it all. Some of it's pretty hard, you know. I'm talking about cutting off heads and cutting open stomachs and hanging people from the tree. And I looked at this earlier and I thought, Phew. but I saw there was kind of a constant thread. All of these people died for the greater good, that others might live, that the blessings of God might flow, that the kingdom would not be divided. When the Philistines were at war again, verse 15, we'll finish up this chapter. David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines and David grew faint. Now keep in mind, David is getting to be 50, 55 years old and he's still charging out into battle with his soldiers. He's not the spry, wiry young man that went against Goliath. And now he's taking on Goliath's sons. And Ishbanab, who was of one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, and he's like, his father's is another giant who was bearing a new sword. He thought he could kill David. He said, I'll really make a name for myself. He killed my father. I, I am responsible for my family to get vengeance on David. And so he neglects all of the lesser soldiers around and he fights his way right up to David and he gets involved in a hand-to-hand combat. I mean, they've got weapons. David and this giant. Now David was still a formidable soldier. He had years of experience. And he's doing his best, but he's getting old. And David's starting to, a little too much aerobic activity for him. He's starting to, and he's falling down and dodging the blows of Ishbanab and and Abishai, who's sort of David's, also his personal guardian. You always see Abishai at David's side. You notice that? Joab's brother. When David went down to Saul, Abishai was there. When Shimei is cursing David, Abishai is there. Abishai loved David. Stayed right by his side as his personal attendant and his guard and his general. And he thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and he struck the Philistine and killed him. And the men of David swore to him, saying, You will not go out and no more with us to battle lest you quench the lamp of Israel. You remember what they said when he wanted to go fight against Absalom? If we die, it doesn't matter. You're worth 10,000 of us. You're the anointed of the Lord. You're a prophet. They knew David was a prophet of God. He was not only the king. He had written all those inspired psalms. He said, we can't afford to lose you. The whole kingdom will suffer. Now what's the lesson for us here? For the good of many, we need to be willing to put our lives on the line. Abishai didn't know if he was going to win this battle. But he saw that David was in danger. And he put his neck on the line to save his king. 
You know, every Christian soldier ought to be willing to do that. We ought to be willing to lay our lives on the line for our king, for the greater good, for the kingdom. What would happen to the kingdom if David died? And sometimes when people are attacking the Lord, what was this giant using? A new sword. What is the sword a symbol of? He has some new doctrines he wanted to share. New theology. And it was going to cause a lot of damage. And he's hoping to slay David with it. You ever seen people take the Bible and try and twist it to turn it against Christ? I've seen that. They've got these theologians out there that think they're very scientific and they try and use the Bible to say Jesus didn't really die on the cross or they say he didn't really rise and they actually quote scripture. they got a new sword. Well, the point I don't want to miss though is David and you read through this story. Goliath had three other sons. David and rather Abishai and the other mighty men of David all put their lives on the line to fight these people who had David on their hit list. How'd you like to know if you were King David that Goliath's four sons were going to try and kill you at any cost? That'd make you a little disconcerting, isn't it? To know that you had four giants out to kill you. And the men of David put their lives on the line to save their king. We need to be willing to do the same thing. Heard about a missionary who was going down through some South Pacific islands where they were practicing cannibalism. And the sea captain, when he was getting ready to drop off James Calvert, they said, you and those who are with you, you're doomed. Everybody who goes to this island and gets killed. And the missionary said, we have nothing to be afraid of. We died a long time ago. You know, when you serve the Lord, you need to be willing to spend and be spent in His cause for the greater good, for the kingdom of God. And if God so loved the world, He gave His Son for the greater good, that the world might be saved, we, like Christ, ought to be willing to give that others might be saved. Back several hundred years ago, the Mohammedans were sweeping across Spain. They besieged the capital of Spain. And King Alfonso, he defended the capital valiantly. But in one of the skirmishes, I don't know exactly how it happened, the Mohammedans managed to capture Alfonso's son, King Alfonso's son. And they made the most of it. Right off on a hill outside the city, they built a big, massive gallows. And the sultan of the Mohammedans, he brought the crown prince up on top of the gallows, put a noose around his neck, and they raised the sign up above the sun. They said, either the city or your son, Alfonso. And all of the soldiers were watching King Alfonso in the city, wondering, what is he going to do? And he said, that my people might live, that my city might be saved, my son must die. And his son was hung in his presence. You know, God did the same thing. For the greater good, he offered his son that you and I might live. And you and I, out of love for him, ought to be willing to, like Abishai, go against the giants and not be afraid and do everything we can to preserve the kingdom for his glory and for his name. If that's your desire, I want you to reach for your hymnal. And let's sing that famous hymn, 159, on the old rugged cross is where Jesus died. Let's stand together.
know, the very essence of Christianity is summed up in realizing that we don't live unto ourselves. No man is an island. We're part of a family. We're part of a church. We're part of a cause and a battle in a kingdom that's much bigger than any one of us. And sometimes we become very narrow and selfish in our thinking. And God is challenging us today to look at the big picture. It's His name. It's His kingdom. It's His glory that's at stake. What do we say when we pray the Lord's Prayer? Hallowed be Thy name and Thy kingdom. That ought to be the priority for every Christian. And sometimes we have to make some difficult decisions and take some difficult action for the purpose of His name and His kingdom. The most important thing is first we've got to give Him all of our heart and soul. Maybe like Rizpah, we ought to spend some time in sackcloth and humble ourselves for the Lord that we might receive the latter rain. Camp out on that rock for a little while and look at the one who hung that uh, we might have the refreshing. There may be some of you here today who have not died on that cross with Christ that you might really live. If you'd like to come to Jesus just as you are, know that your sins are forgiven, be filled with His Spirit, We'd like to invite you to come to the front. We would like to have special prayer with you. We have visitors every week. There may be some here today who have never really committed their lives to Jesus. We want to give you that opportunity now. And the pastors and elders would uh, be happy to pray with you and counsel with you. Come to the front, if that's your desire, as we sing verse 2. I'm of the belief that every story in the Bible is the story of the cross. And some of you might think, oh, Doug, this is a strange presentation to make a gospel call. Well, I see the cross even in this story. There you've got those seven people hung that others might live. You've got uh, Sheba and Amasa and the giant all being slain that others might live. And each one of them in their own way from a different angle is a picture of Christ who ultimately died that the world might be forgiven, that all who come to him might be spared. But I want you to notice that it's not for everybody, it's for those who come to him, that they might be forgiven. You know, I believe that uh, the wrath of God is going to break on our world in the near future, and only those who are under the blood of the Lamb, only those who have the Passover blood over the door of their heart, are going to be spared. Are you under the blood today? If you're not under the blood, this is a good time. All you do is you come like you are and say, Lord... I accept the sacrifice of Jesus in my behalf that I might live. If you don't have that confidence and you want to have it, you get it by asking. Please come now as we sing our last verse. We'd like to pray with you and for you. Verse 3.
Lord, we want to thank you for the presence of your Spirit this Sabbath morning. We want to thank you, Lord, for the stories you give us in your Word. Sometimes difficult things happen, but it's because of your love and for the greater good that many might be saved. And Lord, I pray that you'll give us grace, that we, like Abishai, might be willing to go against the giants, that we might be willing to put our lives on the line for the sake of our King and for the Kingdom. Bless us as we go from this place to keep our perspective. And I pray that we can do everything in such a way that uh, we can let our light shine and attract people to Jesus. It's in his name we ask. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International copyright, all rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministry.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage you. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He is coming soon.